you're looking, make sure you get your left and right one, right? And once again, glad for all of you that are here. We're so glad to have Sister Holly and the girls back. It was wonderful. So it was actually emotional for me. And, uh, and uh, I had lots of hugs and kisses. One little one didn't let go of my neck for about, I don't know, maybe almost 15 minutes. And wouldn't get off my lap even while we were eating. And so that was a wonderful feeling as a dad. And on uh, that mark, remember Father's Day coming up on Sunday. We'll be celebrating here. Amen. And uh, so it's always good to celebrate that. Uh, if you are that, it's good to let people celebrate you. Amen. Uh, sometimes it's a little hard for me. I love celebrating others, but it's sometimes hard to be the one that the focus is on, right? But uh, let, let them celebrate you. Uh, remember all who you are, what you do. And uh, let's celebrate our fathers. If we have a father and still living, be in touch with them. If he's not living, amen. Uh, you know, for me, I'm going to just hold on to some good memories and good hope, and it's going to be a good day. It's going to be a real good day. Amen. Uh, I'm not going to think about what I don't have. I'm going to reflect on what I did have. Uh, that's that's good. That's normal. But I'm going to reflect on what I do have and celebrate that. So uh, remember that. All right. So we've been talking about the sacrifice of worship. The sacrifice of worship. And uh, the Bible says, but him, therefore, uh, let us offer the sacrifices of praises to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to God. Amen. But to do good and to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Amen. Brother Craig, I, I know how you made it for the past 14 years. I know that number one, it's God. I'm straight trying to know how you made it's God. But you know, the next thing is this. The greatest tool that you use is communication. You know, if you're going to make it for 14 years, or you're going to make it for 74 years, there's going to be a tool that you have to have, and that's communication. You know, if you live together under the same roof and you never communicate, it's not healthy, not good. Uh, it probably is not going to be a good thing for you or the, the person that you're in a relationship with. But communication means everything because that is a healthy relationship. And so if we're going to have a healthy relationship with God, it is communication. And God wants the fruits of our lips. Amen. He wants to hear our praise. He wants to hear our praise when things go good. You know, it was very easy yesterday when Brother Dennis came out of his procedure and they got him taken care of. It was very easy for me to say praise the Lord because, you know, my mind had been up on him almost consistently praying and, and asking God to touch him. And then when good things happen, praise God. Amen. The Lord was with him and the Lord provided answers and the Lord worked. I thank God for that. Uh, and that's an easy one. But, you know, sometimes the harder time for us to keep praise God is when things are going so good. When we don't have the answers, when we don't know what's going to happen, uh, when things aren't going well, when we don't understand. Uh, and we're all humans. We all, we all, we all uh, sometimes have to refrain for ourselves or have someone who's spiritually bigger than us. Uh, no, spiritually in a different place than us. Not bigger. In a different place than us spiritually. Refrain for us. We've all been for other people, I'm sure. In our Christian walk, we refrain for people. So uh, sometimes we just need to refrain and praise God. So we talked about Job last week. We talked about how important it was uh, uh, when we look at his life that the enemy saw him. The enemy was disappointed because he thought uh, that Job would not praise God. And uh, we find that God said, Job is going to praise me. Uh, it's not what, by what I've blessed him with, but it's by his, his love and dedication for me. So in his devastating loss, he still worshiped God. We went on to talk not only about Job, but we, uh, uh, we, we talked a little bit about Paul, but we'll talk more about him this evening. Uh, uh, and, uh, let's pick up on what David Wilkerson said. David Wilkerson, if you don't know him, he passed for a church in Times Square in New York City. Very prophetic. He was killed in a car accident. It was him who was killed in a car accident. It wasn't his wife. It was him, and then his wife died. Then. Two days. She, I think she died not long after. But anyway, his son now pastors a church there in Times Square. 
But if you ever read anything of David Wilkerson, it's wonderful. Uh, the, the life God delivered him from. But uh, he said a true worshiper is one who has learned to trust God in the storm. The person's worship isn't just in his words, but in his, in his way of life. His soul is at rest at all times because his trust in God's faithfulness is unshakable. His trust in God's faithfulness is unshakable. He isn't afraid of the future because, he no, because he's no longer afraid to die. How awesome is that? To have the type of faith that you can worship God because nothing about your future is unshakable. Even if you die, it's okay. You're ready to move God. I've met lots of people that have that testimony and that faith, and that is worship to God. That is sacrificial worship. It's in those desperate situations as we praise, as we praise, P-R-A-I-S-E, and worship, W-O-R-S-H-I-P, worship, we allow God's presence and His peace to permeate, to permeate our very beings. Those are the intimate moments that we really learn, that we really learn who God is and what He means to us. Those are the times that we look back and we say, I never want to go through that again. When I would trade the spiritual experience with God for anything in this world. I would say that all of us who have served Christ for some time, you look back in your life and you say, wow, that was really difficult to go through. And I would never want to go through that experience again. But oh, I would never, ever, ever trade the experience of God in there for anything. Maybe it's been through something like, you know, in your marriage, you know, 14 years. Uh, you look back and maybe it's something spiritually where your father battled. Maybe there were some real times of, of, of despair, dark nights of the soul, moments where the enemy fought against you and you felt it. Maybe you felt alone. Maybe you felt as if God had forsaken you. Um, but you look back and you realize that God was really there. We all love the story of footprints in the sand where the man, he, he looks back over his life and he questions God. And he says, God, why is it during the darkest, the deep times of my life that I only see one set of footprints in the sand? And God said, that's my child when I carried you. Sometimes we don't realize it, but God is carrying us. It may not feel like it. We may not see it. We don't even understand it. But those are the moments and experiences where we go through where we will not trade the power of God for anything. Those are the real bro. Uh, I got to meet someone who had come to this church many years ago. And uh, we were reflecting our paths crossed. And it was just wonderful. And they were sharing their life experience with me. And uh, I was sharing my life experience with them. And I walked away and I thought, my, I have grown. I know the notable growth in my own life since, since my time around that person. And uh, some things we would rather not go through, uh, I would choose not to go through. But when you look, you realize that God brought you through it. And we wouldn't trade those experiences for anything because they're mile markers. They're places that are growth experiences for us where the Lord has grown our faith, deepened our relationship, and uh, it, it's just been a real mark. So thank God for those moments. But it's those moments where we really learn to trust God. And we really learn to worship God. Not that worship is easy, but it's our hope and hallelujah, as I said last week. Um, where God works and moves in our life. Uh, where we really learn that God has a plan, who God is and what he means to us. Uh, someone read uh, Psalms 138, verse number 6 through 8. Even if you read it from the paper, you'll know the words. I'll be happy to have you say the words as you read. The Lord be my that have to expect from the Lord, from the crowd we want to borrow off. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt provide me. I shall stretch forth thine hand against the wrath of thine enemies. Thy right hand shall save me. The Lord will protect that of concern for me. Thy mercy, O Lord, and your forever. Forsake not. Praise God. Amen. The Word of God 
says that to the crowd, he's, he's, he's far away from, but to those who respect him, amen, he's close unto the lowly. And he said that when we're in the midst of trouble, and if you ever have trouble before, you know, we have uh, situations in life. Now, I will say this, it is better in our life to take care of ourselves because I've known some people that have not gotten CPR, but they've not survived. And uh, there, there are some that because they had CPR, they were able to be revived because they were really at the right place at the right time with early intervention. Uh, many, many years ago, I remember meeting a man who was in the doctor's office, and who was in the doctor's office, and he had a heart attack and he died. However, he was in the right place to die, and uh, because he had uh, any early intervention uh, medically, that uh, uh, they were able to revive his heart. They had to go to the hospital and do some procedures, but it was because he was at the right place at the right time that it was revived. You want to help know how to be at the right place at the right time? When we are constantly worshiping God, He is able to revive us. Do I think that it's better to take care of ourselves and not look for revival? I mean, it's better just to be sustained and kept and so it happen to be revived? Sure I do. But if we do go through a place where we have to be revived, we need to keep ourselves in a place where we have uh, uh, intervention and we have access to God who's able to revive us. So if we worship Him and we praise Him, we are close to God. But if we're going there and say, I can do this myself. I don't need God. Where is God? Why did He do this to me? And we, you know, that, that's a, a very proud place to be. Amen. And God's far from that person, the Word of God says. So keeping ourselves at a position where we're worshiping God, even in the difficult times, even when we feel like we're in a lowly place because we are keeping ourselves close to God. And if we need revive, the reviver is there. I know the one who's able to revive, and his success rate is 100%. So worship is the key and being revived in the presence of God Almighty. Let's read Paul and Silas. Paul, P-A-U-L, and Silas, S-I-L-A-S, knew what the sacrifice of worship was. They had been beaten and chained up. They had, been, uh, they had, to, be put, uh, uh, they had to be in pain. And it's hard to imagine uh, they wouldn't be discouraged. But listen, but listen to their reaction. Someone read Acts 16, verse number 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and said, Praise the unto God, and the prisoners heard them. The Bible says that they prayed and they sang what? Now, if you are praying and petitioning only, God, deliver me from this jail. God, touch my body. God, pour out your vengeance on my enemy. That wasn't crazy, but they were worshiping God. And they were singing. Somehow they had to reframe the situation. Somehow they had to know that there were sacrifices of praise to God. And the Bible says uh, that, 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 that even the prisoners heard them singing and praising God. A sacrifice must cost something. And I'm going to stop right there. Now, Brother Doug last Monday night told me this wonderful thought. And I couldn't rob this thought from him. So I'm going to let him share a little bit about Paul and Silas and even see the end result of what happened. So Brother Doug, I'll let you take the platform and you share. Well, as, as I was listening to that, it just struck me that as, as a worship, uh, it was perfect worship because it moved the hand of God. Um, it was the earthquake, first of all, opened all the jail. And then you said, think about it. There's a miracle there too. Nobody may stay in their jail. But it's open. So there was a miracle there. God moved on that. And from that point, there was another miracle. The life was saved because the man was going to take his own life because the jail being broke. They interceded for him too so that he was saved. But then there was another one on top of that. Because him and his whole household were saved because of that act of worship that he started with. Because at, at the end of that chapter, the whole house moves. How powerful is that? Do you know how powerful your worship is? 
as Brother Doug said, our worship allows God to rock our world. Do you hear me? Our worship allows God just to rock our world, to unlock the, the prisons, to allow things to break down around about us. I like what Brother Doug said. And then there was, because of that, there was a miracle that no one expected. And then there's another miracle, a man did not take his life. And then there was a third miracle that his family was saved. He was saved, his family was saved. So we can really say four miracles. No one escaped, he didn't take his life, he was saved, his family was saved. We don't know how many people so we can add him up even farther. How amazing is that? Do you know how powerful our worship is? Our, power, our worship is so powerful that it moves the hand of God. Our worship is so important that it provides miracles. Listen, we don't have to have signs and miracles to trust in God and to know God is working in our life. But you know, when we begin to worship God, I believe that the hand of God will move and we will see signs and we will see miracles. And you know what? For the unbeliever, that does great wonders in their life and it brings them to Christ. Don't be looking for the signs and the wonders and the miracles. Some people are looking for that, but just trust in Christ. But as we trust in Him and we praise Him, I believe it will bring signs and miracles. And others will see Christ and come to the saving knowledge of Him. What do we do to build our church? Yes, we fast, we pray, we live a life. But I believe we also worship. If we are murmuring and we're complaining about everything, how attractive is that to a world that's lost and dying? How different is that than the world itself? God is looking for men and women who will trust Him unconditionally, that will worship Him no matter what the surrounding, no matter what the circumstances are, no matter what the conditions are, to worship Him. And when He shows up, expect miracles and believe that God is going to save souls. How powerful tonight. That's powerful tonight. We think that uh, worship is consumer-based and it's on us and that we're going to be the consumer. No, we don't come to be the consumer. We come to be the one who is giving. Amen. We're, we are going to be blessed because as, as God begins to work, we will become the consumer. But our intention shouldn't be to be the consumer. And the ripple effect will go farther than what we can think. Who would have ever thought that when Paul and Silas chose to worship, that it would change the course of the whole family? Really? So I appreciate that thought that Brother Doug shared with me. He shared with us tonight, amen, that, that worship, it, 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 even though it costs, you think they felt good? They were probably tired. It's the midnight hour. It's dark. They weren't feeling well. They weren't where they should be. They were doing what God wanted them to do. People misconstrued them. People turned the tides on them. But yet they still worshipped. Wow. God help us to learn from Paul and Silas. David said he would not offer a sacrifice to God that cost him nothing. Someone read 2 Samuel 24, verse number 24. And he said unto Aaron, Nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price, neither will I offer an offer to the Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. Cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of Amen. So David here is giving us a lesson that our worship and our praise to God is going to cost us something. We are here tonight because we're willing to give up our time. We are willing to give and worship to God. We better in because it will bless us spiritually. God commanded us to. But we are worshiping God. It does cost us time. Listen, I know that we can be tired on Tuesday night, but it's good we're here. It costs us something. Amen. Our life of worship is going to cost us something. It's going to cost us time. It's going to cost us uh, of our talents. It's going to cost us of our, our, our physically, uh, physical things, our emotional, whatever it is. It's going to cost. Worship should cost us something. In Genesis 
22, God commanded Abraham to give his son. That's right. His son, Isaac, for sacrifice. Isaac, Isaac said, Father, we have the... You know what that is? We have the... Folks, that's, that's the second one. Good. That's right. Good job. Good job. Good job. Very good. We have the wood and the fire. But where is the sacrifice? We are in the same condition today. We have the wood and the fire, but we have no sacrifice. Well, we think we have no sacrifice. The sacrifice is our lives. Our lives. Amen. That's right. Our lives, our praise. We want to sacrifice everything but what God asks. Ask. A-S-K-S. Ask for -S -S. us. Someone read Romans 12, verse number 1. Amen. That our bodies is our living sacrifice. Paul was begging, pleading, demanding, if you will, that we be a living, a living sacrifice to God, holy and acceptable to God. This is not unreasonable. Did he or God create, create, C-R-E-A-T-E, create us? Why did he create us? To please him. To please him. To worship him. That's right, brother. In, our, in his own image, he created us. He created us with the reasoning that we would worship him. Someone read Revelation 4.11. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For Thou hast created all things, and for Thy they are, for the art and work created. For Thy pleasure. He said they are, and they were created. So while everybody's chasing a dream, while everybody's doing what they want, we're told to do that, you know, it's good in our life. Our lives need to have purpose. Our lives need to have meaning. Our, our purpose and our meaning should be Christ. We should be seeking the will of God for what is our occupation, what He wants to do in our lives. But the bottom line is this, is that we were created for God's pleasure. And so our sacrifice should be, God, I'm surrendering of myself, all of who I am and what I've created, that I've been created to be. I surrender it to you for your pleasure and for your worship. So we do it all for God. Everything we do, we do for God. Do you think Paul wanted to be in jail? Do you think that Abraham wanted to take his only son Isaac and sacrifice him? But these men are examples to us of what it's like to please God in sacrificial worship. Paul goes on in Romans chapter number 12 to exhort us to not pattern ourselves after the world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our, our minds. To be transformed means to be changed, to, to change the form or the appearance of, to change the condition, the character or function of. How do we renew our minds? We spend time with God in prayer, in prayer, and in His Word. We find out what He wants of us, and we obey. Let's talk about this for just a moment this evening. 
Paul told us not to be conformed, be not conformed to the things of this world. So if we, to be conformed means to, to take like a mold. So maybe some of you have worked with plaster of Paris, maybe some of you have worked with uh, uh, cement, maybe some of you have worked with your kitchen cookie cutters or uh, some type of candy mold. Uh, the earliest thing, some of you up there, you youngins, probably uh, have Play-Doh, and with that you have some molds that you make your Play-Doh. And you know what? You can change the color of it, but if you put it in that mold every time, it's going to come out the same shape because it is molded after that mold. And that mold is not going to change. In this world, there is a mold. You know, uh, uh, we are told how we should accept and what we should do and what is right. And, and there is this humanistic idea uh, of, 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 of things. And, but, but the world, their mind has not been transformed by the power of God. I was listening to Robbie Zacharias on Sunday when I was traveling. And I loved Robbie Zacharias and everything that he was saying. He said that uh, he was talking about raising children. So those of you that's been there know this. Those of you that are there like myself, you're learning this. But he said that when you train a child, he said it's kind of like being that lion trainer. He said, yes, children are raw beast, and you have to be the lion trainer. And uh, he said, you know, when they are born, uh, they come with the sin nature. Um, they are trained with, with, with a nature that, you know, um, no one teaches us how to lie. Doesn't it just come easy when you want to get out of something really easy? He said, I didn't do it. I don't know anything about it. Was it me? Or, you know, you, you come with that nature of wanting something so you may take it and not the appropriate way. And so, uh, you know, children are born with that nature. And if parents don't instruct them in the Word of God, they'll still, uh, you know, live in that, that nature. However, even though we instruct them in the Word of God, their nature is still a sin nature. And it's not until they come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ that we, uh, we each one of us, are transformed from the old nature. We get the Word of God. The Word of God changes us. Amen. We quote it all the time. Behold, all things are passed away, and behold, all things have become new. You know what Christ was saying? Uh, the word of God is this, is that when we, uh, Paul said, but it's the word of God, uh, the words of God Almighty, when we come to allow the word of God to take that old nature that's rooted in us, and it is taken away, and now the word of God comes in, and we're no longer conformed to the things of this world, but we're transformed by the renewing of our mind. There is an enlightenment where the Spirit of God, remember I said on Sunday morning, I use this terminology, that we as Pentecostals, we love to showcase the Trinity, that God the Father sent His Son, and now the Spirit of God brings Christ here with us. Amen. The Spirit of uh, uh, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, makes Christ real to us. He regenerates our mind. We are saved through the blood of Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God makes Christ real to us. Amen. And no longer are we uh, conformed to the things of this world, but we are transformed by the renewing of our mind. And so that's how little lives are changed uh, uh, with their children, by getting the Word of God in them, sharing the Word of God and why we do things. But ultimately, it has to come a day where each one of us accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. And now we are changed by the renewing of our mind. We're not conformed. So yes, even though uh, it may be acceptable in the world, the world says this is okay. But God's Word says it's not okay. And, and God's Word calls it for what it is. It is sin. And so you may say it's acceptable and it's tolerance, but I have to say I can love people no matter who they are or where they've been, but I have to label it for what God labels it. It is sin, and it's not acceptable in my life. Amen. And God doesn't want it to be acceptable in anyone's life. 
to understand that you are working with people that their minds have not been regenerated by the Spirit and the Word of God and the blood of Jesus Christ. And so we are on different levels. We can talk to our blue in the face. They may never understand us because they don't understand the love and the power of God. But don't you be conformed to the world. Don't let it become acceptable to you. Get in the Word of God. Amen. Allow the Spirit of God to continually transform you. And then when it comes into our worship, people may not understand when, when someone is diagnosed with something terrible. Someone may not understand when someone goes through hard times. Even Job's friends didn't understand. Uh, they just simply did not understand. The prisoners in Paul and Silas' prison, they heard, but they probably did not understand uh, why these men were praying in their current condition. But you know, Job and Paul and Silas, they were renewed. They were transformed. They were conformed. The church has got to come out of conformity. And we've got to break free to worship God. You know, to most folks, you know, Abraham, he's off his rocker to take his son, his only son, and sacrifice. But he said, I'll sacrifice even when it costs me my everything. Are we willing to sacrifice even when it costs? Because God's looking for our living sacrifice. It's going to cost us something. All right. I think I stopped that Paul continues his exhortion by telling us not to think that we are all in, uh, that we are the all important one. We all have different gifts, gifts, G-I-F-T-S, and abilities, A-B-I-L-I-T-I-E-S. And we should love and encourage one another. You know. We are taught in life, and it comes from just human nature, that we are the important one. We're not the important one. God's the important one. And so when our life story has been written, may it be God's hand to build the story. And may it bring Him glory and honor and praise in our good and in our bad times. Because we learned to offer a sacrifice. He tells us to conduct our business, our business, B-U-S-I-N-E-S-S, -S -S, in the right way. Serve God, be fervent, F-E-R-V-E-N-T, rejoice, be patient, P-A-T-I-E-N-T, consistently be in prayer, give to others. You ready for this one? Hold on to your seat. Bless our enemies. Bless our enemies, not curse them. Be compassionate. Treat everyone fairly, F-A-I-R-L-Y. Be totally honest. Totally honest. Be a peacemaker. Don't be vengeful. And then the chapter ends. So I want to read Romans 12, 28. Be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, amen. I am uh, by Listen to a testimony of a woman that uh, President um, President Trump pardoned. She was an African American woman, and she had been pardoned in prison um, because she uh, got herself in a room where she was selling drugs, and uh, that became her life. And because of that cost her her life, her 
prison. And when she uh, was in prison, she really uh, gave her life to Jesus. And she was given a testimony of what she was going to do with her life, how she was going to live it for God, and how that she was grateful. But you know, she said, I think it was 25 years she had been in prison, she just glorified God for what God had done in her life in all of those years. She had missed a lot. And she lost so much time. But her whole testimony was nothing but praise and edification. Be encouraging. See, we have to, and even though she may have felt she was unjust and done, you know, people can feel that way. She still just glorified God. Even though she had made a mistake, she glorified God. God wants us. And even when people speak evil and do evil against us, you know, I'm still learning this. Because in, in me, I want to be a voice that stands up. But God says, keep on loving them. Keep on doing what you right. Overcome evil. We have to know that God gives us the power of that ability. I'm going to stop there because I'm almost on 45 minutes. Does anyone have anything they want to say tonight? We'll start um, next week. We'll talk about authority, placing ourselves under authority. Um, we'll talk next week about forgiveness and what that really means. You know, we feel like we have the right to hold on to things in our lives. We don't have the right for any of that. Because it becomes about us and not about God. This life is not.